I'm delighted to have the opportunity. I, I've been struggling a little bit with a little bit of a cold, and everybody gives you every kind of remedy they can possibly think of, you know. They tell you you need to try this. Someone told me the other day you need to try a little Jack Daniels. And I thought, well, I like Charlie Daniels. I voted for Mitch Daniels. I guess Jack Daniels be all right, too. I don't know. Well, you got to be careful with that. Well, I, I, I'm also glad we're back on the Internet. So thank you to both of you who are watching tonight. <laughs> Appreciate you tuning in. Exodus chapter number 14. Exodus chapter number 14. You know, that second verse has some real doozy words to try to pronounce. And uh, I initially was just going to read a, a couple other verses, but they really are applicable and appropriate with the passage as we read it. And I thought if I'm going to make Brother Colston try to pronounce those, we should all try to do it together. As I look at this passage of Scripture, and it's undoubtedly one that's very familiar to us. We, we love the way the, the Bible unfolds, and uh, so often it... Uh, its stories are very clear. They're very easy to grasp. They, uh, they make good sense. And as we've seen them, we've perhaps even in our minds, we've visited those locations. We've maybe perhaps not the, had the luxury or the opportunity to have been there personally, but we've seen it. We, uh, we're familiar with it, at least in our mind's eye. We can see the setting as it unfolds here. We can see the Egyptian army off in the distance. And while they may not be visible, we know their approach is imminent. We can see the dust as it begins to rise from the approaching horsemen. And we can see that great expanse of the Red Sea that lays before the nation of Israel. We can see the thoughts of fear and doubt that are certainly hovering upon, upon the nation of Israel. And then here between this particular location, you have the setting of Migdal, which means tower. And by most accounts, it would have been over perhaps on this side. But it would have been a large, foreboding, fortress-like. It was to be a, a watch guard, if you will. A boundary, perhaps. Then you have Pihiroth, -Pi which is another place perhaps on this side. And you have Migdal, which is probably near Suez in that particular vicinity now. But really, the nation of Israel, it looks like they're in a most unfortunate place. It looks like for them, there's no way out. You have literally the Red Sea, the Egyptian army, a rock, and another rock. You have the nation of Israel, perhaps it could never be more clearly said, between a rock and a hard place. You know, sometimes that's where God puts us. Sometimes he says, this is, this is where you're going to be. And you may be here for a while. You know, it's interesting, he tells them to camp there. The word camp does not give any indication as to its duration. It just says you're here. You know, a lot of times we don't like an answer like that because we want God to tell us, okay, all right, What's next, God? It's as he did with Paul. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? His moment of salvation. And Christ, speaking to him, said, Arise and go into the next city, and it shall be told thee. In other words, I'll tell you later. Do you know that most of your Christian life is spent with the echo of the words from God? I'll tell you later. It's no wonder our children always ask us, are we there yet? Or they ask us, what's next? Or where are we going? Or what are we doing? And we always want to, our children want a detailed explanation. And you get frustrated with them. And you sometimes wonder, you know, enough with the questions. But how different must it be for us when we go to God with the same inquiry? I think probably very little is different. But he tells the nation of Israel, he says, you're here. I want you to camp here. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know how it would all work out, and you never do. God never does tell you exactly how anything's going to work out. Had he told Paul, he would have said, 
okay, I'll tell you the rest of the story. It ends with you in jail being beheaded. I don't think Paul would have liked that story. I think Paul would have asked for a different book. But it was the book that God had for him. And here in the life of the nation of Israel, God has already shown himself strong on their behalf. He has delivered them in a most miraculous way. And he has, as the writers would later tell in the Psalms, he has cast the horsemen and the rider into the sea. But they didn't know that was coming. And much of what happens in our lives and where God places us, we look at it and we say, but why are we here? And not only that, God, I, I'm not just content to ask why. I want to know for how long. I want to know what's next. And God does for us what he often does for his own. All of his own. He remains strangely silent. Such was the case with the nation of Israel. And so tonight, you may think that you are indeed in such a place. It may be in a personal vein. It may be such that you're thinking, well, my life's that way. It's unfolding that way even right now. It may be that you're battling sickness. It may be that you're hurt. It may be that you're battling any number of things. It could be that your finances are out of sort. It could be that you're dealing with bad news from afar. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be any number of things. And so, so you may and think you found yourself in such a place between a rock and a hard place. It could be that we view this in the corporal sense, and certainly it's applicable there as well, that we wonder why God would have placed us in such a place. And we wonder when we were there on our road to Damascus, why was it that God would place us here? And we wonder for what reason, and for how long. And sometimes God just says to his children, camp there. It doesn't make any sense but camp there. In fact, if, it, if you look at this, the nation of Egypt had to look at this and say, boy, look, we got them now. I mean, we know in verse 3 what he said Pharaoh would say. Yeah. We've got them now. I mean, they're stuck. They're up a creek. And God's still strangely silent. Camp right there. I'd like to share just a few thoughts with you tonight from that particular passage using the title, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you to guide our words, our thoughts. Help us now as we preach. And Lord, we do pray that you'd be pleased, you'd be honored. God, we're grateful for all that we've heard. We're thankful for the song and, Lord, just the opportunity to be here. Lord, we'd ask you to give us strength now. And we pray you'd be pleased. May your will be accomplished, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know this, first of all, that I am here in God's season. I know that. You know, the Bible's very clear. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Now, if that applies to this, the sending of his son as the savior for mankind, then do you think that the things that are orchestrated in our lives happen and catch God off guard? Do you think the nation of Israel just happened to show up do you think that God in his wisdom and his omniscience looked back and said, I didn't know they were getting out that early. I don't have anywhere for them to be yet. I'm surprised. I didn't know Pharaoh was going to do it then. I thought it would have taken two or three more plagues. I had a couple doozies waiting for him. He let them go slightly premature. And so because of that, I don't have anywhere to go. So let's just hang out right here. Let's just camp by the Red Sea. We're foolish how we view God sometimes. But everything that happens, it's either in God's timing or it's not in God's timing. And either God is in charge and God does indeed govern in the affairs of man or he does not. But you, in whatever state it is in your life, you're here in God's season. It may be a divorce. It may be a disease. It may be sickness. It may be hurt. It may be suffering. It may be the corporate body here as First Baptist Church, but whatever it is, it is indeed God's season, and you must not forget that. It is always God's time. God's never late. God's never early. The sisters to Lazarus begin to ask the question, and it's always the wrong question we ask. You know, it, 
It's amazing. It's like in uh, John chapter number 9, the man that is born blind, the question that's asked is, who sinned? They don't want to know why this man was born blind. They just want to know whose fault it was. You get over to, and, and by the way, the Lord tells us it was for my glory. Nobody did this. I did this. It's for my glory. And then you get over in John chapter 11 and Lazarus is dead. And his sisters began to ask the question, you know, why weren't you here? And they use a different language and perhaps not those exact words, but the context is clear. God, if you'd have been here doing what you could have done in the timing that you should have done it, none of this would have happened. And I'm amazed, you know, God lets us say whatever we want many times. He doesn't interrupt us, but he well could have but all of this was not for Lazarus. It wasn't for Mary and Martha. It wasn't for the crowd that had gathered. It was for God. But God didn't show up late as Lazarus lay wrapped in grave clothes. God was right on time. And for the nation of Israel, I, I imagine the angst that begins to rise up within them as they got a rock, another rock, a Red Sea, whose depth in most places is 2,500 feet. It wasn't a small body of water. And the behind them, they can see the dust as it begins to rise in the distance. They can hear the approaching Egyptian army. Okay, God, you told us to camp here, but why? And why now? God didn't answer. In fact, the only person he ever gave any kind of an answer to was Moses. But the rest of them would have to find out later. Don't you hate that? It's like, tell me. And God says, no, I'll tell no one. Or I'll tell the only person I want to tell. In this case, it's Moses. But rest assured that God is never late and God is always on time. And so if you find yourself personally or corporately between a rock and a hard place, you must remember this and remember it, remember it well. I am here in God's season. Not my season. But God sees it. No matter what age you are, no matter what your station or status in life is, you are here. I am here. And God sees it. Then secondly, I am here by God's supply. It's up to God to take care of me. Can you imagine when God sent them out, and I know they gathered up much goods from the Egyptian people. They borrowed their gold and silver. I, mean, I don't imagine any of them ever hoped to return it again, but they borrowed it, you know, much like we do. Hey, I'll get this back to you. Yeah. And so they head out of the nation of Egypt. And, but I would imagine they're not packing a whole lot in the way of consumable and perishable goods. Now, they have animals, of course, and livestock. But we're talking about a crowd that numbers, by most accounts, probably in the millions. And they get out there and they begin to think, okay, we're out here. We've left Egypt. We've got the Red Sea and we've got a rock, another rock, the Egyptian army. Now, how is God going to get us out of this mess? Do you know that God doesn't always get you out of your mess? Don't misunderstand me and I'll bail us out here a little later in the message. Do you realize that it is arrogant to think that God owes you an escape route every time you get in trouble? I mean, really? Well, I'm saved. I trusted Christ as my Savior. I, I know that, uh, that he'll take care of me. Well, it may be God's will that you perish. But it's very clear that I'm not only in God's season, but I'm also in God's supply. That means God's going to take care of it. You know, I remember as a boy growing up, I never had to worry about anything. Dad was always going to take care of it. Now, there are a lot of times when I may not have known exactly what we were having for supper. Many days I would go in and I would ask my mom, hey, what's for supper? Sometimes she'd tell me, sometimes she wouldn't. But I always knew that something would be provided. It wasn't always my favorite. It wasn't always as I would have preferred it to be, but there was always something at my father's table. There was never a time that I walked in there and I felt like my father had abandoned me. 
There wasn't any moment where I felt like that he had forsaken and left me on my own. I always knew that I could count on my father. Do you realize that as God's people, if we are indeed in God's season, that we also must be in God's supply? Either we believe that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his glory, or we don't believe that. Well, that's talking about food. It's talking about shelter. It's talking about raiment. It's talking about clothes. Well, I'm confused then about the word all. I mean, really, I, my, my vocabulary is, is pretty clear when it comes to the word all. God said, you're my child. I'll take care of it. What does that mean, God? I don't have to tell you. It means I'll take care of it. What well, does that mean you're going to bring ships in here and carry us across? And the same hollow sound comes. What well, does that mean that that fire that has guided us by, by night and given us warmth, does that mean you'll consume that Egyptian army? Hollow and silent again. They hear nothing. But all of those questions abound when you are between a rock and a hard place. Because you wonder, is God really on time? And is, is God really taking care of things? Well, either he is or he isn't. But my God shall supply all my needs. So I, I have to trust him to provide. But I also have to trust him to keep. And I have to believe that no one else can get me out of here. I mean, after all, think about it for me tonight. Picture this throughout the message. Red Sea, Egyptian army, a rock, and a rock, and here I stand. Okay, God, what are you going to do now? Well, it's God's season, and it's also God's supply. I either believe that or I don't. Do you believe that tonight? Because truth of the matter is, most of us either right now or at some point in your life, you have indeed been found or found yourself between a rock and a hard place. I'm here in God's season. I'm here by God's supply. Then let me say this further. I'm also here in God's school. That's important. I'm here in God's school. You say, what does that mean? He's trying to teach me something. Do you know that most of us, pro well, I'm sure, God's omniscient. He knows everything. So God probably looks at all of us like we are the educable slow. Because God knows he already has it figured out. And most of the time, God is, and I don't mean that in an offensive or derisive way at all. I'm just saying that's probably how God views us. He looks at us and says, you don't get it. It took the nation of Israel 40 years, and most of them never got it. Most of them died in the wilderness. Why? Because they were in God's school. You know, God does not give homework. He gives heart work. Do you know that? A lot of times people, you know, you ask your children, they come home, you got any homework? You know what? We, every day of our life we ought to be able to ask, do you have any heart work? Because every day of our lives, you know, we sing the song, God's still working on me. Well, that's just a cute song. No, he is. And some of us are very, very slow learners. And so God places in, in spots in our life and predicaments in our lives, and he says, camp there. Well, how long? Camp there. Well, how are you going to get us out? Camp there. Well, what, what's going to happen? Camp there. What are you going to do to that water in front of us? Camp there. What about that army behind us? Camp there. I wonder if God ever gets tired of telling us. Now, I know the Bible says that he loved us with an everlasting love. And I know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that about God. We know that about God. The love of God is greater far. Oh, I love that song. 
But he told them, he said, just stay there. Camp there. I'm not sure what God is trying to teach any of us in our lives right now. I know that Job in chapter number 6, Job is a puzzling story in a lot of ways. I, I really haven't figured out and never will, because the Bible says his ways are not our ways, they are past finding out. But I look at Job, and the Bible says, God says this about him. He says, there wasn't anybody like him on the planet. One that feared God and eschewed evil. And so, in spite of all of that, God said, so devil sick him. I would have fought the other way. I would have thought that God would have said, this guy is a rascal. This guy's ornery. This guy's crooked. This guy's horrible. He's got a terrible disposition. He's ugly. He's mean. He's unkind. Let him have it. We'd have all been on the sidelines and said, well, that makes sense. Well, I get that. I understand that. The guy had it coming. But not Job. Job, they had to look at Job, and his friends came by, and they were speechless. They had no idea why God was allowing that to happen in his life. They could only have assumed that it was because of Job's wicked heart. There was something that Job had done. There was some sin that had remained unconfessed up to that point. And so all those thoughts begin to flood their minds, and they look at Job. And Finally, Job in chapter number 6, Job says something to God. In the most revealing sort of way from a personal standpoint, he says to God, teach me, O Lord. Wow. In other words, I'm camped right here. I don't know why you killed my children. I don't know why you allowed it to happen. I don't know why you took all of my possessions. I don't know why I'm now impoverished and why I'm covered with sores and I long for death and I curse the day I was born. I've lost the affinity of my own wife. And so while I'm camped here, God, just teach me. And you know what most of us do in the midst of those horrible times? We say, God, why? God, fix. God, clean. God, pick up. God, take care of. We never do say, okay, teach me something. Maybe that's why God knew he could pick Job. I'm in God's season. I am here in God's supply, but I'm also here in God's schooling. Then fourthly, let me say this, I'm here in God's service. God's service. You know, we, we say it. I mean, we have it down by rote. We have it well rehearsed and well versed and well memorized. We know that our life and our purpose and our, our chief aim, we can quote the scripture verses that are applicable. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is what? Come on, say it. The whole duty of man. So we, we know that's why we're here. We know that's why God made us. We know that's why God created us. It wasn't so that we could enjoy life. There's a lot of things about life to enjoy. There's a lot, of, a lot of things that are pleasurable. There's a lot of delight in life. I, I, I enjoy ha the fun. I enjoy family. I, I enjoy those things. But that's not why I'm here. God didn't make any of us to become successful. God made none of us to have wealth or worldly gain. God made none of us to live a long time and influence as many people as we could apart from his glory. Every person in here from the top row to the bottom in the choir, each and every one of us on the platform, we are made for one reason, that was for him. And so while I'm here between a rock and a rock in Egypt army and the Red Sea in front of me, I have to remember this. It's for his service. It's not for me. It's never been about me. It's always been about him. In the midst of your rock in a hard place, did you forget who it's all about? 
I can imagine this Egyptian or this the Hebrew children as they began to look at Moses and they began to argue and bark up the chain until they got to Moses. They talked to their dad and then their grandfather and then this one and send word, we're not happy. We ain't happy. We're disgruntled. We're, what, what, what's going on here? And all that word began to spread and work its way up. That's probably close to how it happened. We know they were the mixed murmuring multitude. And as all of this, you know, you know I, I can imagine as God is observing all of this as it's unfolding, knowing, of course, from eternity past how it would already unfold, but as he's witnessing it unfold in human terms, he sees all of that and he says they still don't get it. It's not about Egypt. It's not about Israel. It's not about Moses. It's not about the Red Sea. It's not about the Egyptian army. It's not about any of this. It's all about me. And most of the time as we go through things where, you know, this, this crowd is, boy, I'm, I'm hungry. And all we're going to have is manna. How long is that going to last? I'm going I'm to get pretty tired of that. I mean, it was biscuits. Maybe we could get some gravy with it. It'd be all right. You know, I, this, this isn't going to work very well. But it, it's not about you, and it's not about your appetite being filled, and it's not about your thirst being quenched. It's, it's not about your satisfaction or your delight in any way. Now, don't get me wrong. God loves us. There's no question about that. But it, this life, boy, this sounds unkind. But this life has never been about you. This life has never been about me. You know, I, I just turned 50 a couple of weeks ago, but those 50 years were never about Stuart Mason. Now a lot of folks sent me cards and notes and happy birthday and condolences and all of those things. And the, by the way, the first card I got was from the AARP. I'm thinking, how do they know these things? Man, they could track you down anywhere. But, you know, as I look back over those 50 years and where I've been and where I've lived and what God has allowed me to enjoy in this life, none of those 50 years were ever designed to be about Stuart Mason. They were always designed to be about him. And some of you tonight, you're camped. I don't like this. I don't like the Red Sea here. I don't like the rock there. I don't like the rock there. And I don't like the fact that I can hear that Egyptian army come up. And God's just saying, remember, my season, my supply, my schooling, and your service for me. It's always been about his service. Then let me say this, fifthly. The Bible says in verse 3 there, for Pharaoh will say, of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. I'm here in spite of God's scoffers. Do you know a lot of people will write you off when you're camped here? They will. They'll write you off. They'll think, look, you've been trusting that Christianity stuff's not working out so well for you. I mean, you turned your back on what you could have been, what you could have had, how much you could have made, and who you could have enjoyed in this life, and all of those things. You, you forsook all of that. How's that camp working out for you right now? I mean, the crowd that was left back in Egypt, minus the loss of the firstborn, they would have had plenty of reason to delight and joy. Look at them. There they are. They wanted deliverance. They wanted to be set loose and set free and... Now, look where they are now. There's a rock. There's a rock. There's a Red Sea. And the Egyptian army hot on their heels. Boy, how, that ain't working out too good for you. But I'm here in spite of God's scoffers. And I don't know how long I have to camp here. And I don't know what's going to happen while I'm camped here. And I don't know how God is going to deliver me from this camp. But I know that I am here in spite of the scoffers of God. It doesn't matter what they say. Never matters what they think. 
The words of the world matter not when you're listening to the words of the Lord. It really all depends upon who you decide to listen to. And who are you listening to today? And by the way, those scoffers may sometimes be God's people. I mean, our church has its share of detractors, maybe as much now as ever. But look at the old church downtown. And here we are on this camp. And we got a rock there, Egyptian army there, rock there, Red Sea in front of us. And the only thing we're doing is God said camp here. And if you listen, you can hear the scoffers. You can hear them. You can hear the crowds. How's it working out for you, First Baptist? Am I being too frank? <laughs> too transparent? How, how's that working out for you guys? Not as good as you thought it was going to be. And you know what's so frustrating? Is you can't get out of the camp. Because you didn't put yourself there. You're sitting here. You know, you want out. Man, you want out. And man, you wish God would wipe them away. You wish he'd open this up somehow. You'd like to see those rocks brought down to the level of a plane. But he hasn't done it. And you're just right here, pacing back and forth. You're fasting, you're praying, you're doing everything you possibly can. And you're just trying to figure out, why am I still here? And he's not even answering you. And that crowd out there, they're blogging. They'll probably be posting tonight since they're live. Hi, welcome back. We've missed you. <laughs> That's where we're at. It's where you're at. It's where we've been. And maybe where you're at personally. And maybe where you're at physically. And you may be there totally independent of what our church has faced in recent days. But in spite of the scoffers of God, you're still here. That's not bad. Not a bad place. I mean, Egypt was once my home. Brother Gray, help me, you know this one. I, once, I was a slave, helpless and sin did roam. It's in the paperback book, brother. You know, but, you know, as I, as I think about it, this place really is not too bad. I mean, it's not a bad place to have to camp. I camped in worse places than this. I mean, I was in Egypt just a few days before making bricks without straw. I remember being beaten by, by those that would oppress and suppress me. And here I am, free. Free indeed! Free indeed. That's not a bad spot to be in. I didn't say it wouldn't be frustrating. I didn't say it would, be, would not be aggravating at times, but I'm here in spite of God's scoffers. And then finally, let me say this. I am here for God's splendor. Glory is a better word, but it didn't fit the outline. I need an S. God's splendor. It's his glory. Now, you know, in a matter of moments, it, it's, an, it's an unbelievable event that's about to occur. It really is. It's phenomenal. I mean, I, I, I love this story. In fact, in your Bible reading, you do great getting up through here. You can read this, and this is cool. You get over Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you know, it's, Chronicles. But here, man, you're flowing, man. You're on a roll. And you read this story, and you know what's getting ready to happen. You can see it. Moses, there he is. He's got the rod. Dude, the rod's coming out. You can see it. And he says to them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord for the Egyptians, which you have seen this day, which means they could see them. Ye shall see again no more. And 
God parted the waters. Can you imagine? I, 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 just standing here. I was thinking of another song from the paperback. Standing there at the Red Sea, God's people began to complain. That paperback's a good book, Brother Gray. Soon Pharaoh and his mighty army would take them in bondage again. And I, I'm sorry, just drifting for a moment. But here, uh, here they are, and he's waves that rod across, and the waves begin to part. The water begins to part. I don't know if it was done instantly. I don't know if it was done gradually. I don't know, I, I, but I know it happened. And I know they went through on dry ground. And I would imagine that probably as they're going across, they're, they're looking at it as the wagons are pulling through, and there's still some of them that are watching, though, as all of this is unfolding, and they're thinking, but those guys are still back there. I mean, this is good, God. This is cool. Touching the water there, watching the fish. God's biggest aquarium right there, you know. That's cool, you know. You know they did. You know those little Hebrew boys were there, you know. Someone's probably even casting a rod and reel in there. I mean, look at those. Where's the net? Get the net, Grandpa. But as all of that is unfolding, and there they are in that camp, and they're crossing now. There's probably some back there who say, yeah, but they're, they're still back there. I'm not sure this is going to work so well. I mean, I, I, I see. And then they start moving. And you know those guys, you, you know, honestly, you don't want to be in the end of the, the Hebrews. You don't want to be the last guys. You don't want to be Zephaniah if they did it alphabetically. You want to be Abraham. Let's go, let's go alphabetically. Abraham. You know, Zephaniah, Zechariah, they're standing there at the back. You know they probably are going in backwards. I mean, really, they're, they're crossing scared to death, afraid about what's about to unfold. They didn't have any idea. But you have to understand that God said, here's what Pharaoh's going to say, but it's very important to understand that fourth verse says, and I will be honored. And I will be honored. And I will be honored. Do you know that everything about this camp for the nation of Israel, everything about the camps that God finds you in from time to time in your life, personally or corporately, it is always that God gets honor. Now, hang on a second. I'm, I'm almost done. That doesn't mean you're going to get out. Now, you might. But you might not. He said about John the Baptist, there was none born greater among women than John the Baptist, but I'm going to chop his head off. And I don't know how God got greater honor out of that, but he did. He said about Joseph, nobody in the Bible has said more of than Joseph. The Lord was with him and caused all that he did to prosper. Yet he was stripped and seized and sold as a slave. And spent time in prison for a crime he never committed. And was forgotten by the butler long after the effect of telling his dream. And God said, it works for me. Joseph said, it doesn't work for me. In fact, he said, remember me. Would you remember me? And he forgot him. And God said, Joseph, this part of your life, this camping area here, it doesn't make any sense to you, but it works for me. And Paul, you're probably wanting out of that jail cell, but the last sound you hear will be the swift sound of a blade of an executioner. And Timothy, as you preach and, and you, you apostles and disciples, as you spread the word, almost every one of you will lose your life for the cause of Christ because it works for me, God said. We're very spoiled. We're almost inoculated in contemporary Christianity in America. We feel like, and, and, I, and I, I love the songs, and I believe it, and I pray, and, you know, the songs like, God delivers again. Well, not always like you think he will. God does always deliver. But it's always for his glory.
He put them here between a rock and between a hard place. But it was for his glory. It was for his glory. You say, why? Well, the Bible says that in all things he might have the preeminence. Does he? Well, he will. Whether you or I choose to let him have it or not, God will. The Bible tells us in Romans, For I reckon that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. It doesn't mean that God always gets you out of the camp safely in your mind. But it does mean that God always delivers in a way that not only suits him, but gives him the greatest glory. Let me say it this way. God delivers in his time, in his way, but always for his glory. Where are you tonight? Are you between a rock and a hard place? Well, you're in God's season. You're in God's supply. You're in God's school. You're in God's service. You're here in spite of the scoffers, but ultimately, everything about your life, everything about my life, ought to scream that in all things he he might have the preeminence. That God might get the glory. The Bible says that thou, thou, Lord, art worthy. Thou, only you are worthy. Not me, not this church, not this building, not this ministry, not any single one of us, God. Only you and only you alone are worthy. Nation of Israel took a long time to figure that out. But at some point, God came through. He always does. And it may be as you've hoped, it may be as you've prayed, and it may be as you've pleaded. But it will always be in his time, in his way, and for his glory. And that's many times why God puts us between a rock and a hard place.